Awesome. Welcome, everybody, to the Adobe Fonts show. We are live once again. Hello. Hey, everybody. Welcome, all. Hope you're all are doing well. Got a few people. Yeah, a few people in the chat already. Yeah, let us know where you're from. I'm Ari. I'm in San Francisco, and I am the library manager for Adobe Fonts. I'm Ben. I'm a content producer for Adobe Fonts. Used to be in support. Used to answer a lot of questions. I'm in Brooklyn. So let us know if you're West Coast, East Coast, or other coasts, other places. Hopefully we have some people from all over the place. Yes. We have Norsh, Cody, Michelle, Dixie Ann. Welcome, welcome. Indeed. It's going to be a good topic so, today. We're glad you could make it. Yeah. I hope we have people from all over the place that speak all different languages because we're going to be talking about that today and trying to make ourselves keep ourselves more informed and knowledgeable about how all different languages and writing systems uh, are represented and how to make sure that when we're designing for other languages, we keep in mind how they use diacritics. Um, to read the, the words that they're writing. <laughs> it's very important stuff. So yeah, we're excited to have you all here. For those of we you new. Molly. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I get excited by the chat. Oh, no, chat's good. Jess, Jess is here. Hello, Jess. Thank you for joining. Christopher. Leroy. Molly. Nice. Awesome. Well, for those of you new to Adobe Fonts, hopefully most of you have tried it out before, but if you haven't, it's uh, 20,000 fonts that you have available with your Creative Cloud subscription, and you can use them for commercial projects like t-shirts and websites, and you can use them in for all kinds of things, making logos and doing eBooks and book design and all the things you could imagine. So. If you've not checked out Adobe Fonts, Ari's gonna show you really quick a little bit around the website and how you can get started, but hopefully uh, you go after this and try it out because uh, it's pretty awesome. And um, we want you to take full advantage of what you get with Creative Cloud and Fonts is a big part of that. So so here we are, uh, Ari's gonna show us a little bit about getting started with Adobe Fonts. Yeah, so here we are on the Adobe Fonts website. If you've never been on here, welcome. If you have, it's a little refresher. So when I'm here on the browse page, which is the all fonts tab up here, I can see I can pretty much look through everything and I have a few tools that help me to discover new fonts or find exactly what I need. So um, I can use these tags. So I click on calligraphic, it brings up a whole new set of fonts. If I click on any one of these tags, I should get a new mood or genre that may fit my project. And then I can narrow down even more with classifications here. Um, the classifications are a little more basic. You might not know exactly that you need something for um, a wedding, but you do need a serif. So you click on serif. Um, and then there's even more filters here. And there's a lot of other things to discover on this website. So we have our recommendations feature, which is a way to discover new fonts that you might have not seen before by filtering through trending or newest or hidden gems or staff choice, which is something that we curate for you. And it's a really engaging way to discover new things. And we also have our foundries page, that I wanted to show you today because we have one of our Foundry partners as a guest who's yeah. in the green room waiting. <laughs> backstage. Um, <laughs> backstage. So this is a way to discover new Foundries that you haven't seen before. Or if you're using a font that you really like, you can go here and see what else that Foundry has created. So for example, briefcase type. Um, our guest is the co-founder of Briefcase Type, 
And you can go to this page and see all the fonts that are under this foundry, click on one of them. And let's say you discovered this family through a tag or through something else. Um, the way that you would find the foundry is here right under the name. It says where it's from or it has a little about information at the bottom. I feel so, like I feel like going to a foundry page is kind of like going to a record label page where yeah. that their taste and their approach to things is kind of represented across the catalog although you're going to get different bands with very different sounds you're going to get kind of a good perspective or so if you like something from them you might like something else from them like that's happened with me with saddle creek records or or other record labels like that it's very similar um so totally yeah so that's a little behind the scenes, not behind the scenes. I don't know why I keep saying that. That's a little <laughs> tour of Adobe Fonts website. And of course, if you activate fonts um, from Adobe Fonts, then you can use them immediately in any app on your device. It's very seamless and easy. And we've shown this in countless live streams before. So if you need a refresher, we have a live stream called Getting Started in Any App Anywhere with Adobe fonts. And that shows you how to use the fonts in um, every app. We even do mobile on there as well. So you can see how to use it in Fresco and Illustrator on your iPad, so. Yeah. Yeah. So check out those replays, um, but we don't wanna keep our guests backstage any longer. No, and so to- <laughs> Yes, go. <laughs> today, <laughs> we have Radek Sudun of Briefcase Type. He is a type designer, a type educator, and has just released a book, which he's going to talk about today, um, based in Czech Republic. So, hello. Welcome, welcome. Radek. Good to have you. Hello. Hello from Prague. Yes. Good to join Hi. us from Prague. You're the first person on, on our stream from Prague, so it's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Let us know in the chat if anyone has been to Prague or is from Prague. I've never been, and I would love to go. Same here. One of, one of my favorite we can travel. synthesizer manufacturers is from Prague uh, called Bastel Instruments. So, yeah, I would love to visit and visit their shop and perhaps come see Briefcase Type and other things. So hopefully one day. I've never been there either. I should, I should go. Yeah. Bastel Instruments. Super cool stuff. Uh, modular synth stuff, but they cool. also do like effects pedals and anyways, cool things like that. So they're awesome. Um, really quick, before we dive into the topic, we just want to do a quick poll with the audience to gather some sense of where people are at with the topic today. Uh, and so what is your fil familiarity with diacritics, diacritical marks? What is a diacritic? What does that mean to you? Do you have a basic understanding? Are you, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, or are you just in InDesign's glyph palette and language support panel all day long having a good time? Um, so let us know uh, where you stand on uh, today's topic. Either way, I think Radek's going to take us from a really good introduction and then through some of the tips and tricks that you can uh, get started with in Adobe Apps as well. So let us know in the yeah. chat. and uh, Answer with a one, two, or three so we can see. Yeah, one, two, or three. Let us know. And I think Saki says hello from Prague. Awesome. So we have someone else. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, Saki is, is well, she's actually Japanese, so it's a really multilingual, uh, mm. multilingual situation. Awesome. Wow, that's awesome. Awesome. We've got- Cody is a one. Yes, I'm, I'm somewhere between one and two, I would say, you know, um, I think. Although I've seen this presentation already, so I kind of feel like I was one and now I'm getting closer <laughs> to two. And maybe after this, I'll be getting closer to three. So. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's not a rocket record science, you know, we'll be fine. Excellent. I think. <laughs> I think we're all at a basic uh, or one or two. Yes, one or on two. Excellent. Well, then let's dive in um, and get started. Radek, take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hello, hello again. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, to, um, as been said, we will talk about our critics today, um, and I will be 
my presentation will be will be split into three parts. And at first of all, I will general introduction to the problem of diacritics. I say a few words about what actually diacritic is and what are the, probably the biggest problems we have. Uh, later, because you know we are hosted by Adobe, I will show you a few tips and tricks in Adobe apps, how to use you know languages and what should you you should be, you should pay your attention to it while you are type setting. Mm. And later, I will introduction the book about diacritics as a, as a visual tool that may actually help the design uh, diacritical marks to student uh, the designers and the designers. So <clears throat> let's start with the with the with the diacritics in general. They are probably uh, there are more than seven seventy languages in Europe using the the Latin script. Some of them disappeared. Others they, they are spoken by only a small part of, of the population, and the most use useful you know, number of only a dozen. But a famous basic set with twenty six Latin characters is not enough for you know it's not enough for typesetting in other languages. Hmm. Um, and speaking of you know Anna, and that the other languages, you, they use various extensions. Uh, for their written forms, and that extension making it possible to denote the specific local phonetic differences. Um, so you would say that diacritics create extensions of the 26 letter alphabet so that you can pronounce other sounds that are not included in that. Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, and there are actually more, you know, it, it's not only about 20, 26, basically, letters. Um, and diacritics actually, uh, diacritical marks are actually not only the, only the extension that we can use for like specific local letters and glyphs. There are also other, you know, and, um, uh, other tools. Uh, but we'll be talking, speaking about, about the accents, you know. Um, and because accented character usually consists of the base letter, which is usually supplemented, uh, supplemented by mo mostly above, below, and across by a jacket mm -hmm. or mark and an accent. Um, you know, and that problem actually is you know it's been here for for many years, but mainly, and in in the nineteen nineties there was a time of rapid growth in digital typography. And that growth did not bring the same growth in interest in conceptual language support for typefaces. And this uh, and this gave rise to a situation well known to many graphic designers. <laughs> a typeface they wanted to use in their design does not contain all the characters in their language. Mm. Well, so maybe, everything you've been showing us is wrong, yeah. like problematic, right? Because I think yes, it's not very is, clear if you don't know. Is, so like everything you've been showing uh, us is bad. <laughs> well, I would think what I would be showing, if I go back to the presentation, there are obviously something missing in the in the typeface. Right. Here. And this is actually one of the problems we have with their critics. But there's more, and I will be talking about it later. Um, maybe I should also explain why why do I feel authorized to speak about correct diacritics or even creating the correct examples of diacritics? Um, the answer mainly lies in the fact that we have many years of experience with accents uh, design in our region. Diacritics have become something of a local tradition. And I'm not talking about as much as about historical experience as I'm about the recent history when we had to localized typefaces ourselves for our own use hmm. uh, i mean during i'm, I'm in, in a, i've been working with type and typography for probably more than 20 years and during that years i've localized probably a hundred typefaces for myself my my self project and also for many foundries you know, hmm. because, because i work as a consultant for, for many funds all around the world and often I even my devices or design in my uh, accents for, for, for them. But, you know, we be speaking about like missing accents and uh, but we have to, you know, because diacritic is not only like a visual extension, it is visual extension, but in fact, we need to, we, we need to speak about the meanings because in fact, the same word using accents can have a totally different meaning than the word 
just with OER critics. So I will show you one example. This is a very simple, simple sentence. You know, it's not complicating about that. You know, um, and a different is just this. It's the same sentence, only accents. With accents, I said my date is forty-seven years old. Without accents, you will get a totally different <laughs> meaning. So be careful. Pay your attention to it. Track critics matters. This really, is very really important. important. This is very important. <laughs> this is very important. So be so be careful. What we have seen now, um, that was the first problem we have. That the probably this problem, the, uh, what we've seen so far today, it was a problem when actually their critics was missing, or you know, uh, because they, they actually simply accents were not in the font. So that's mm. where you know, we couldn't basically use them. But the other problem we also have is that dark accents are already there in the font, but they are badly designed. Mm -hmm. The language support and contemporary typefaces, uh, contemporary computer fonts, has improved by the creative as well itself, which contains sort of like artistic work with accents, often remains more markedly imperfect. It it, it seems it seems like they might get second or they're not the main focus of what the type designer was doing and so they you know and they don't know exactly how to use them and so they design something maybe stylistically you know i don't know if yeah. that makes sense you know um like that yeah, well, can you it tell us what's sense wrong to me. <laughs> when you show an image um, can you tell us why why it doesn't look right i mean um, the accents are, are are important and and it's a inherent part of of glyph set mm. and they should be designed designed in in a similar way and they should be in a harmony with the, with the, with the main time faces and they should not uh, get too much attention you know it's an important part the same part as other letters and we should approach them in the same way um you know and uh, yeah so even the situation got better so far uh we still can you know there's still we can still see some kind of almost bizarre uh <laughs> designs so um and for for us often it means that we have to we have to uh, put but either partially or completely redesign for accents or characters or accent characters from the scratch because you know simply you can't use them and uh, my activity the goal of my activity is to prevent this situation uh, and to the point at the way towards the satisfactory resolution. Okay, so can you show us in any of your previous slides just like what doesn't look right about the characters? Because I can see, maybe I can tell that sometimes the accents are like, too thin and the letters are thicker. Um, sometimes maybe the accents, are they placed yeah. in the wrong place? Sometimes like, can the... you show us just one of the well, slides previously and tell us? Well, the accents, well, okay. Probably this is probably the most visible, um, visible uh, example. Sure. Someone has commented on Twitter, uh, just don't do it. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Don't do it. Um, just don't do it. Well, you know, the accent has to be in harmony. The weight of the accents should be more or less similar to to, to the main, to the mm -hmm. base characters, and uh, and also contrast should be the same, and so on and so. On. And of course, you should respect the, the the design and construction of the letter, because you know, for instance, this looks more like uh, accent called whatever or bra, uh, but in fact, it should be Karen. So you also has oh. to has to respect respect the root of the accent and kind of adapt your design to it. If the otherwise so if the, you will so, get misleading misleading. Yeah, if the accent doesn't look in harmony with the design, you could also make it could look like the wrong accent because you know yes. it's not appropriate. I mean, this looks this like is, the Nike yeah. swoosh, and the this looks like a slab serif <laughs> kind of thing. It just does not. They don't look like they go together to say the least. No, they don't. No. Yeah, and you said it should have 
it's supposed to be a Karen. So it's supposed to be more like this. Um, yeah. But it's and okay. it's like this. <laughs> like this. Okay. Yeah, but this just is, wanted to but, see but in, an example. In this, in this case, this, this, this discussion is quite ridiculous because it's so badly designed that we just should drop it and start it again. Okay. <laughs> it's not worth dwelling on. I get it. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think that's that's uh, well, you know, this is enough for the start just to get into what actually this diagnostics in general about, and then and description of these two problems when it, when it's either it's no there or accents are there are barely designed. Mm -hmm. um, now I would like to switch to InDesign and show you something else, but it's still regarding to language use and language support, shall we? Yes, please. Yes, Exciting. let's go to InDesign. Get your shoes on. We're taking a walk to InDesign. Right. We have a few more people so, that joined, so I just wanted to say hi. We are here with Radek Sidun talking about diacritics and language support mm -hmm. in InDesign. And we have Sol with us. We have Mike, Sean, Michelle, Andreas. Barbara. Yes. Nice I think see you all. Stephen asked asked earlier. So, is a diacritic what I what we would call an accent? Could you just talk a little bit about the difference between a diacritic mark and an accent, or are they the same? It's the same. Okay. It's the same. Great. So yes, Stephen. Awesome. So um, now I will show you a few because we are hosted by Adobe. So I would like to show you a few a few things that you should yeah, that your all designers should pay attention to it. And I will be showing these uh, you know, these tricks and ideas on typefaces that are actually available. Uh, they are just, you know they are in our foundry or the briefcase type foundry, and they are also available uh, at Adobe Fonts. So first thing I would like to show you is uh, is the access to alternative letters. Or just choose any letter which is a part of the of the, of the glyph set. Okay, let's have you know, let's have to this beautiful um, 70s revival typeface. Um, here, if you if you choose the letter, you can actually get this thing, which is possible alternative. So you can choose either that, or you can open the glyph palette, which is somewhere here. Nice. Um, and you can choose many, 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 many other either alternatives or accented letters and so on and so on. Nice. And we'll be using that palette uh, a couple of times today. Strongly connected to it, accents uh, are often, are often uh, open type stylistic sets. So let's have a look at this. Um, you can, you can, for, if you design your typeface you are using open type style to set, you can choose the other letters you like, nice. or you can go back using using type palette. Um, again, you can choose from here another letter. Um, you can also use the contextual contextual substitution or or ligatures, uh, and so on and so on. Let's have a look. Nice. This is can be also quite smart, and these open type features often can help you um, to choose the right right uh, letter in terms of context of the word and choosing the right language. Um, there is another example using using uh, open type stylistic set. Um, because this is a situation because uh, nowadays also in the past they used to be popular for headline typefaces they used to be popular uh very thin accent like that oh nice and you know sometimes sometimes can be disturbing sometimes can you know something that's what you what you want for for your poster and and these alternatives can be hidden in stylistic sets so you can either switch them on or off so is there a reason why these thinner marks were popular for display usage? Well, it's, it's kind of charming in a way. And also, 
What is quite difficult for, especially for the languages in Central Europe, because we use a lot of accent, that we cannot have a tight leading. We cannot have a tight typography like you can have in English. So let, look, let's have a look on that. Um, if you get rid of the rid of accents, um, you can do that. And it looks hmm. better for headlines, for instance. You can do it. Yeah. Well, we can't with accents because they are just disturbing and they will be touching the line above. Yeah, See? especially if they're the larger kind that you showed before. Yeah, so this, yeah. this thinner so version. Sometimes, some, yeah. So you see? So the mm. thinner version might help, you see? Yeah. So you can see, you can, you know, in the, in the, in the 60s and 70s, it used to be quite popular in Czechoslovakia and also you know, the whole Central Europe, you know, also in Poland. But you can still see them now, uh, but it's not so often. But it's, it's, it's a great feature. It's a great, it's, it's a great open type feature yeah. using, you know, using that. But it's not, it's not only, you know, accents, it's, you know, it's a stylistic set that you can use for any substitution, right? Nice. Um, this, now we are getting more, more to languages. Um, this is interesting. When you are actually typesetting, when you're using your text and tin design, I always recommend to set the right language that is actually dedicated to the text. So for instance, here on the character palette, you choose the Romanian language. This maybe could be about Turkish. So we will choose the Turkish language here. And I will show you something what can happen if you if you don't choose the right language. Let's say we can put a Polish there. See? Oh. In some situation, choosing the right language in design can automatically use or uh, use the right letters dedicated to one particular situation or the language like that. For Very cool. Oh. So this That's is a really this is useful. <laughs> Yeah, this is a situation what happened in the 90s when actually, because this, the, the S cedilla letter, actually S comma accent to be precise, was added to Unicode later. And the old phones, they were using the, the, the different names. So now to prevent the situation and to use the right language, um, um, this is a feature that can help help uh, now improve the situation to, to do it. Can you explain what Unicode is? You said that one of the characters was added to Unicode. Um, Unicode. It's a big question, I guess. <laughs> well, no, no, um, no. Um, Unicode is a. Where to start? That's a. It's an organization. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technical. It's an organization. It's also a technical. It's also a technical standard, which defines a unified text encoding. Each character has uh, has a unique numeric code and number, and the standard includes a vast number of languages, and even though they are not longer in use, so um, now nowadays, because we are we, we have a phone typefaces, phones using you know, and also apps using Unicode, so each letter has a special special code and you can't get it wrong and and, and that will have improve the, the the perfect types of thing and, and correct using of languages that's a that's a worldwide standard that we all mm -hmm. use nice. thanks to the organization of and even in websites right the websites are using it as well for html and other things behind the scenes any yeah. any and most of i would say any language uh, any app today any software solution somehow use unicode in the part it was different. We have a different coding because the number of letters in the font was actually limited. It was a 256 letters, but that time is, is gone, luckily for us using <laughs> the critic yeah. and other extended languages. Yeah, so there used to be a limit and now there's no limit in the amount yeah, of there used Yeah, there used to be a limit, as I said, there used to be a limit 256 fonts uh, and oh, letters or glyphs in the font. And mm -hmm. uh, the basic set, so-called Western, uh, wasn't wasn't really choose too wisely because they no no one really conceptually think uh, a thought of 
languages they should be added to the set. There are, all, I would almost say, kind of randomly, randomly chosen letters, and some languages were supported, like French or Spanish or German, and some of them were not, like Pol Polish and Czech and so on. I believe it also has something. So, so it has also something has in common with. Uh, with the very past when was the when Europe was divided to like a Western democratic yeah. part and also communist because you know uh, the business wasn't so ongoing and and it wasn't so well connected and and uh, I believe it has also something in common but it was a it was a problem for us because for choosing the right languages we have we need to have a different language cliff set like usually Central European so we have a plenty of different fonts. You had a version for Western Europe, then you have a font for, for Central Europe. It was just a mess. Thanks to thanks to Unicode, it that is gone. Nice. Yeah, thanks for explaining um, that. This is another example of using or, or choosing or setting the right language you need to look at. And this is a Catalan language. And just simply when you choose the, the right language, this is automatically change to the correct combination. Nice. So probably a good um, rule of thumb to set the language every time in InDesign. Would you say? That's yeah. just a good rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, of course of course, I mean, I guess you know, most of you no know, Americans or, or British they um usually is writing in English. Hmm. So and and InDesign is defaultly set or can be set to English or another language, so default setting would also help. But just pay attention if you if you use the different languages and then set the, your language uh, setting correctly. Nice. Um, yeah, I think um, we. If you speak English, you're mostly designing in English. But let's say a company says, "I want you to design packaging for these three different languages. Do the same thing, but just mm -hmm. change the language." You might. Yeah, that be given can like help. exactly. Yeah, yeah you that might can be help. This given can the... from difficult situations. Yeah, you might see it and say, "Oh, this is what I'm supposed to put on the Polish label," and you don't know if it looks right or not. So, if you don't choose that language and apply the exact style that it's supposed to look, um, you may never know that it looks wrong. Hmm. It's Even not. It it's not. Apparent. It's not exactly uh, all right, but it's a good start. Yeah, a good rule of thumb. <laughs> and then always consult with a native speaker. Yes. <laughs> to see if it looks. Yeah, good. that. I mean, I always recommend that. You know, just, just you know, uh, especially when you have a design some uh, is a packaging or stuff. Just and you are using the different languages. To, just get some some uh, some native person involved. Mm. <laughs> That's always always yeah. a wise choice. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it can happen very easily, and it happens to me all the time, you know, because there are so many things that you need to be aware of, um, and because there are so many differences for you know, you know each each language for it's slightly different. Yes. And speaking of yeah. that, this is an example. You know, this is a good example of it. For instance, um, we have a other feature called hyphenation, which is probably you know, everyone is familiar with that. But look, oh, okay. Look what happened. What happened here? Using and choosing the setting, the right language is important also for hyphenation, because, uh, for instance, English has a different hyphenation rules than German. Mm. So look what happened when you choose the different language. So be careful. This is mm. an example of why it's worth doing, worth setting the right language. Nice. Um, this oh. is also similar, also uh, also a similar situation. Look, what? Okay, Ben is speaking English, so he's using using that uh, using that quotation. But what 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 would have happened if, for instance? A uh, famous German philosopher would react or discuss, like, I like, would say, um, uh, 
Do we have any German speakers in the chat? Yeah, I hope there's if there's I uh, uh, it's written correctly. If not, let me in the chat. I will fix that. <laughs> yes. Okay, and because I choose the the German language for the sentence. Look at the quotation mark. The quotation mark was automatically set to the German version because German quotation mark is different um, than English one. Very cool. Uh, so just set the German or any other language you want to use, and then you will get the correct quotation mark for that. If you don't do it, and you choose the English flag here or Greek which is not correct. You will get a different result. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, so this is uh, probably it for, let me check if I have, yeah, for the, for the InDesign features or language support. Um, many of these things actually also works on also the other InDesign app, uh, uh, Adobe apps like uh, Illustrator. Nice. And it depends on on on, on supported features for each particular app. Uh, Saul says that was correct German, so excellent. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. And Michelle says it's the same in Dutch. Oh, nice. Nice. Right. So let me switch back to Keynote. Any questions? Any question in the chat? We did have a couple questions. Uh, maybe it's a good time to ask. Um, Sean asked, what would you consider being major no-nos in the world of fonts and marketing? Do you have a, any ideas about that? And I think a major of what? Like major no-nos, like things you don't want to do. And I think there was a follow-up which says, would you say that certain fonts portray certain tone or personality? So. Yeah, but that's kind of a different question. Yeah. Two big questions. What should people avoid um, if they design a font and they want to promote it and, you know, market it? Designing a, designing accents or diacritics in general? In general, because you're a type designer, I think it's a question for you because you've released fonts and you've marketed fonts. Just in general, are there things that people should avoid or you see, you know, major no-nos, major things that don't look good? Well, the wrong accents, the wrong diacritic marks yeah. seem like major no-nos <laughs> after, after this. <laughs> so I would say start uh, there. Well, <laughs> um, well. In a book I will show, I'll actually I'll be showing later today. Um, I've set sort of like ten commandments of uh, of correct diacritics. So oh, I would recommend oh. to read it. Um, these are ten basic uh, basic rules of creating accents, and I think that can help everyone to start. Good. Uh, uh, either design them or use them in these settings. And and Saul or asked. Would you recommend using that contrast between the bold letters? So you remember you showed the kind of headline sans serif bold typeface that had the different accents, the thinner version and the larger version. And I think they're just asking why you would recommend the thin ones over the over the bolder ones. And I think you mentioned tighter typesetting for that, right? That you could you could do tighter letting um, in headlines if you use yes. the smaller. Yes, it, that. Yes, it's for title editing in the headlines. Nice. Okay. Because these 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 tiny or the thin accents they were usually designed for headline typefaces. Okay. I actually like how they look too, just stylistically. I think they look great. So. Yeah. If if anything, it looks cool. You know. Yeah, it looks cool. <laughs> awesome. Looking cool is important too. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you know, we have to just say it through. It's 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 true. And uh, no, Norsh no, asks, no, not, not everyone's oh, do it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry, go. I was just going to say, Norsh asked, uh, "Will the Manual of Diacritics be shipped worldwide?" And I'm sure you can get into that as you're talking about the book. Yes. Excellent. Yes, it will. And I will tell. I will say a, a bit more about it. Fantastic. So, shall we move on? Yes, let's do it. And we'll yes. keep an eye for new questions. Keep the questions coming, everybody. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, oh well, so first of all, well, at the start we saw two two problems when actually when accents are either are not in the typeface or technical marks or accent letters and the problem is that actually they are there but they are barely designed so what i did i prepared a book um a collection of of case studies uh, of newly designed accents for for, for contemporary typefaces um what is um um you know, um, because the first of my work is a pictorial textbook, which is which my students and I could have used on many occasions in the type design and typography studio mm -hmm. at the Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague. And so the manual or these publications in the domain for, for them and SN, uh, as well as for the other type designers who assume have a knowledge to of typeface structure and the other requirements. Um, with few exceptions the drawback of literature devoted to diacritic is that they are predominantly textual or often lack sufficient illustrations um, and because we are designers most of us work visually a textual description of how something should be correctly done and how the result should look is not very helpful examples should be primarily shown in a specific approaches visualized and clearly demonstrated Hmm. And this is why our, instead of complicated descriptions of the problem associated with uh, diacritics, I chose to put together a set of clear visual examples of possible solutions. To achieve this, I completely redesigned from the scratch all accents and uh, of selected typeface you will you will see today. Um, people ask me often, how did I choose the typefaces? Well, this is actually crucial. I mean, this is a crucial aspect of publication. And I was select, you know, uh, for the, the selecting typeface for the, for the whole, whole concept. Um, so, so the guide for my selection uh, was this book. This book was, you know, and this classification of the typefaces was created by Professor Jan Solpera, who is you know, he taught the typeface uh, in our school for, for many years. So he influenced the, the generations of type designers in, in, in Czech Republic or nice. Czechoslovakia in the past. And his way of, elevate, of evaluating and tracking the relationship of letter forms and, um, has proven to be the most appropriate for my solution. They are. Uh, um, there are many other system of evaluating uh, on typefaces and categorizing typefaces, but this one is quite, quite common in our country, and for the basic groups, it's quite similar to the other one. Um, I narrow it down to the part of the classification that works with sans serif, romance, and typefaces that are more or easily identifiable. I deal with 11 categories, and I've mainly concentrated on the most commonly used categories, the, the text typefaces, more or less. I guess everyone is interesting with, on what sort of typefaces are there. So there we are. I deliberately designed it, designed accents for typefaces host, um, and uh, host applications for the intended uh, objective net, uh, objectives Cover the most of the possible uh, options or variants. To keep the scope manageable, I work with the basic styles, regular or medium, uh, italic, and, and bold. The other aspects also influence the selection. I especially try to apply my solution to, um, to contemporary typefaces that are now or have recently been popular. Uh, I believe that the contemporary typefaces will be more reliable or, um, or 
understandable, particularly for the for the young people, you know, or students. Hmm. Uh, they will be much more easy to understand that they're all designed like sort of like medieval Venetian, you know, Roman type piece, whatever. But I also have to say that in no way does my selection uh, represent a judgment of the, of the practical qualities or aesthetic typefaces. I all like them in many ways, and and it was fun to work with them. Hmm. For each typeface, I set a, a group of selected languages, um, and on and this and um, and this glyph set is usually is possible to typeset in all in all common European languages. And this glyph set is process or design or I design for each typeface or actually in each font because I have a in total 32 fonts in my collection. Um, the pages in the book are showing the, the categories of typefaces that I've you know, included to my selection. And and I also show the diacritical marks in text. And this is actually very important because you know it's not only you need to think, you need to understand that the accented letters are actually part of the whole the whole the whole the visual system. You know, you need to re, you know you need they, you need to see the rhythm of the typeface, um dynamically typeface. So it's always good to see the, the, the accented letters you know with some letters around and get and, and see whether they are in some harmony uh, or in the right contrast to to the whole overlook um, and the structure basically is the same for all typefaces so so uh, now the, the, the page is actually comparable so you have a bold you have also also italic and this is a more or less uh, designed for all you know prepared for all typefaces that covers probably around 80 pages in the book can I ask a question? Sure. Um, all of the typefaces you selected, did they already have the glyph for each of these um, accented characters, or were some of them uh, missing? Well, I would say many of them they did, at least later, because I started, you know, I started with this essay around like 12 years ago, and I was a student, wow. it was in my diploma work. Uh, in that time, some of the typefaces I chose to, you know, and I choose uh, for the selection, I selected. They didn't have a full uh, accented uh, glyph set, but uh, as I said, it took me 12 years. So some of them, I know most of them, they, they have them now. But I still, because as I, as I said earlier, this is a case that I try to, design all accents from the scratch to have yeah. all of them designed by one person to give the one personal subjective, I have to admit, view how to design accents, how to approach the critics. And now in, in this moment I'll also and uh, in this moment I'll also have to say that that uh, they are more than one possible solution in our idea you know of of designing of design diacritics, you know, as so this is uh, they there are there's a coexistence of several correct solutions. So my solution is also is part of the coexistence. It's just one of them. So I'm not like super strict that you know it has to be designed. Yeah, I just but want it's to interesting to hear that. It's it's very interesting to hear how subjective these diacritics it is, can it is, be. It, it, is, it is subjective, but, you know, yeah. because I want to, you know, to, to, to show my ideas and my approach, and uh, I, I apply them on, on so many typefaces to make my ideas between the categories and typefaces in one group comparable. Yeah. It seems similar to just in general with graphic design, where there are parts of it that are very subjective and parts of it that are very objective, and you're kind of combining those two things together and trying to come up with something that that is suitable to the language, but perhaps fits the typeface or fits the design of the typeface, you know, uh, as well. So kind of balancing the objective and the subjective, uh, which is cool. And yeah, making it's, it look it's a bit, cool. It's a bit of, That's important. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a minefield. I'm aware of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's really well, awesome to see all those different pages that you were just showing and how the same text um, looks so different and the accents really 
harmonize with the font. Yeah. Um, but I have a follow up question to my previous question. Sorry to keep interrupting. But <laughs> you said that some of these some of these typefaces are old, like they were designed a long time ago. But in the last 10 years, they were maybe redesigned or someone added accents and someone added diacritics. Um, do you know what that process is? Like, how does that usually happen? Is it because people who are buying the typeface ask for that and then whoever yeah. designed it has to add them in? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly as you said. I mean, yeah, some sometimes I, it's not so common these days because most of the typefaces they have at least some uh, extended uh, language uh, glyph set. Uh, but if not, usually just email the foundry and tell them, hey, I want to use them. I need to use the typeface in, in, the, in their language. So could you extend the, the glyph set to mm -hmm. it and so on? And the foundries and designers there, they're able to listen now. It, it, the situation has massively changed to, you know, to good. But I also have yeah. to, you know, speaking about, you know, choosing the existing typefaces, I also have to say that because m most of them or many of them, all of them, they already have their you know, accents designed by their designers and the foundries. Um, choosing the typefaces, I'm not criticized them for, 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 for their design. I'm, I'm, it's, as I said, it's a case study um, and uh, this is for educational purposes. Uh, I just try to you know, find some answers or possible answers or one mm. of the possible answers how to design that. And, uh, and I said, so there, there, are, there are a few other coexisting solutions that are correct. So this, there is no clash to it. Nice. We have about three minutes left um, for the stream. Um, I think we are, we are at the end. Oh, so excellent. I can quickly summarize that. Mm -hmm. that so the great. book, the Google book uh, covers 32 languages, 15 typefaces, 32 fonts, and uh, it's a 192 characters for each font. Whoa. And the total, and the total, the 192 for 30, for 32 fonts is 6,144 characters in total, and it looks like that. So you that have... probably explain why why it took so long. <laughs> You've drawn a lot of diacritic marks. <laughs> like a um, lot. <laughs> yeah, so as I said, it's intended, intended to, to designers, so, you know, the, the young students to gather, you know, the one who is interested uh, and I also a web website where you can pre-order the book. The book uh, is already being printed now. Awesome. It should be done within the two, three weeks, I hope. Um, and I will ship worldwide. And um, and the book is published by by uh, Umprum University when I when I'm actually working and I was studying and I was teaching and so on and so on. Um, there's a website, the address, and and I also uh, this is very very important to me. And I have to say again, mm. I would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to work in in this book with typefaces and this public publication awesome. could not work with typefaces. So thanks to me for work about my Anna, thanks to Monotype and uh, who was actually very, very open to to let me work with that and so on. And also other foundries. Adobe, Google, Federigone papers, because the book will be printed on a beautiful Federigone paper. Nice. Uh, oh, nice. And well, the, uh, yeah. a KB the, bank and type together. I have to change the type together. Nice. The the images on here look beautiful. I'm sure having the book in person will look even better. Um, if everyone in the audience who's interested in diacritics and language support, definitely pick up a copy of this book. To me, it looks like a beautiful thing to have on your coffee table, even if you aren't designing credit diacritics yet, and you just want to thumb through beautiful typeset pages. So, you know, um, definitely check it out. And really fast, I just want to share uh, Radic's links. Uh, you can follow Radic on Twitter and also check out briefcasetype.com. And of course, uh, briefcase type on our website. Check out those fonts. They're fantastic. The open type features are great. 
And of course, the language support is fantastic as well. And then check out the Manual of Diacritics. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was so nice to have you all in the chat. Ari, Radic, thank you for putting this together. Uh, this was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for Ari. joining us, Radic. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Ari. Thank you, Ben. And thanks for, 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 for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye.